Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeads, and welcome to Apes Video Notes for Topic 8.8, .8, which will cover biomagnification. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe both biomagnification and bioaccumulation and their effects on ecosystems. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve designing a testable hypothesis for a scientific investigation. So bioaccumulation is the buildup of persistent organic pollutants or other fat soluble contaminants uh, that accumulate in the bodies of organisms over time instead of being excreted as waste in their urine. So remember back to POPs, these are gonna be compounds that because they don't dissolve easily in water, don't easily enter the bloodstream and don't easily exit the body as waste. If we take a look at why this is, again, it's because they're fat soluble. So these are compounds like POPs, uh, methylmercury is a great example. And again, because they don't dissolve easily into water, they don't enter the bloodstream and they don't leave the body as waste. So instead of this happening, they're going to build up in the tissues of the organisms and reach higher and higher levels over the lifetime of the organism. Uh, so this is a great diagram here to help us remember that bioaccumulation is the buildup of this contaminant in one specific organism over its lifetime. Now that's different than biomagnification, which occurs more in food webs, and we'll be talking about that shortly. So now we'll take a look at how biomagnification is a little different than bioaccumulation. It happens because of bioaccumulation, but it's a more macro level effect or an effect that occurs over a whole you know, trophic system or a food system. So biomagnification refers to this idea that fat soluble compounds, so again, hops, persistent organic pollutants like PCBs, um, or methylmercury in the case of seafood here that we're focusing on, is going to build up and accumulate in these trophic levels at higher and higher concentrations in organisms at higher trophic levels. So let's take a look at a helpful diagram now and break down the steps of biomagnification so we can understand it at a higher level. So it's all going to begin with the producers. And so POPs or methylmercury, as we can see here, are going to enter marine sediments or it could happen in terrestrial ecosystems as well but they enter the sediments or the soil and then the plants in those ecosystems take them into their bodies. This could be phytoplankton in the instance of this marine ecosystem or grass in a terrestrial or an aquatic ecosystem. But once those uh, persistent organic pollutants or that methylmercury enters the body of the primary producer, it's then consumed by the primary consumer. So these could be zooplankton or you know bottom feeders or just small fish or insects. Um, and then those are going to start to accumulate these pops in their bodies as well. Since they're fat soluble, they build up in their tissues over time and reach higher and higher levels. And so we have bioaccumulation of these primary consumers, but that's gonna to lead to biomagnification at higher trophic levels. And this is a kind of nuanced or tricky point to understand. So stick with me here. When we get to secondary consumers, they have to eat the primary producers, uh, the primary consumers, excuse me, and take in their biomass or their tissue. And because of the 10% rule, organisms at the secondary consumer level are going to have to consume far more biomass, you know, to get the equivalent energy that the primary consumers had to. So as they consume more biomass, they're taking in higher amounts of these persistent organic pollutants or methylmercury, and they are accumulating it in their bodies over time as well. Now, by the time we get to the tertiary consumer level, they have to consume even more biomass to get the equivalent amount of energy. And so they're going to accumulate these pops or this methylmercury at higher and higher levels in their bodies as well. So bioaccumulation happens to a single organism. It's their buildup of pops or methylmercury in their fat tissues over time. But biomagnification occurs again because of the 10% rule. Organisms at higher trophic levels have to eat so much more biomass that they're exposed to the levels that, was, that were accumulated in the organisms beneath them. And so a very nuanced and kind of tricky point to understand here, but one more time, individual organisms bioaccumulate these pollutants over their lifetime. They store them in their fat tissues, but then organisms at higher trophic levels uh, reach higher and higher levels of these pollutants because of biomagnification those organisms eating large amounts of biomass that are contaminated over their lifetimes and continuing to build up these levels. And so if we look at this diagram, we can see the whale being the highest uh, tertiary consumer here, or actually looking like a quaternary consumer. Um, that's going to be the organism that has by far the highest levels. You know, the, the salmon that's eating the herring, that would have the next highest levels. And as we go down the trophic levels, we have decreasing levels of persistent organic pollutants and vice versa. So as we go up the trophic levels, higher levels of persistent organic pollutants.
Now we'll take a look at another instance of biomagnification, this time focusing on DDT though instead of methylmercury. So DDT was a wide, uh, broad spectrum insecticide that was used all over the world, but was eventually found to be you know, carcinogenic and really harmful to humans and to other organisms, and so it was phased out of use. But because it's a persistent organic pollutant, because of its chemical structure, it doesn't degrade or break down easily uh, in ecosystems, and so it stays around for decades even after it's no longer used. Um, so in many aquatic ecosystems, there's still DDT in the sediments at the bottom of those ecosystems. So the issue here is that those sediments are oftentimes taken into the bodies of bottom feeders in these ecosystems, so primary consumers, or zooplankton that are going to basically just absorb it in through the water or through small amounts of sediment they're taking in. And it may have really, really low levels in the water and in those organisms. But what happens is as each successive, successive trophic level has to take in more and more biomass, it's going to biomagnify in those organisms. So let's look at an example here to try to understand this with some actual numbers. So we may have extremely low levels of DDT in the water, uh, but over time, the zooplankton are going to take in more and more DDT. They're going to accumulate it in their bodies. That's the bioaccumulation is one organism accumulating the pop or the uh, DDT in this instance in their body. And so that might reach 0 0.04 parts per million. Well, that may be a really low level. It may not be toxic to the zooplankton. Uh, the small fish that eat those zooplankton are going to eat a lot of zooplankton over their lifetime. They're going to bioaccumulate, and we now have biomagnification because it's reached 0.5 parts per million in those small fish. And again, that's because they're taking in so much of that zooplankton over their lifetime. When we get to the large fish, it may reach two parts per million due to them having to take in more and more biomass from the small fish or that uh, secondary consumer trophic level, and it reaches a higher level over their lifetime. When we finally get up to the osprey, or in this case, a quaternary uh, consumer, they're going to reach levels that may be as high as 25 parts per million because, again, they just have to eat so many large fish. They have to eat such a large amount of biomass at being a quaternary consumer because of the decrease in energy availability and energy transfer at each level below them. And so that's going to lead to levels that are high enough to actually have effects on these organisms. And one of those effects is the thinning of their eggshells. So we can see here photos of a peregrine falcon eggshell, but this actually happened as well with the bald eagle and was one of the causes for the passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973. So bald eagles had this dramatic population decline in the US and it was linked to DDT causing thinness in their eggshells that was actually you know, killing their hatchlings before they could even hatch. So that's a big problem and with the eagle being our national symbol, you know, we decided that something needed to be done about it because how do you have a country whose national symbol you drove to extinction with your pollution of you know, DDT and other persistent organic pollutants? Um, so it's a really interesting kind of case study of how biomagnification can just have dramatic impacts at high trophic levels. And we'll wrap up today by looking at biomagnification with respect to mercury specifically. So mercury is going to be released into the atmosphere primarily through the combustion of coal when it comes to human sources but also through volcanoes if we're talking about natural sources. Um, so this mercury can either be released into the atmosphere or it can you know, float out in the particulate matter that's released from coal-fired power plants. So the mercury could actually attach to other pieces of ash or you know, PM that's, that's released from these plants. And it's going to be carried by the wind and then deposited into aquatic ecosystems far away. So remember that these pollutants can impact areas even that are far from their discharge site. Um, but then what we need to know about mercury is that it's not mercury itself, or at least mercury in an elemental form, that's so toxic. It is the form of methylmercury that bacteria produce when they convert that mercury in these aquatic ecosystems. And so just an important kind of apes uh, knowledge piece to have here, or hashtag apes knowledge. Uh, we have to know that it's methylmercury that is so toxic, not just mercury. Uh, so once it gets into these ecosystems and once bacteria convert it into methylmercury, organisms like phytoplankton are going to take it into their bodies. And then, of course, it becomes biomagnified at higher trophic levels. So let's take a look at a diagram here to help us understand how it reaches such a high level in these top predators. So again, we have it being released anthropogenically from the combustion of coal, especially coal-fired power plants. It's released into the atmosphere and then is carried by the wind and deposited in aquatic ecosystems, again, far from its release site. 
So once it gets into those ecosystems and it's converted into methylmercury, we can see here that zooplankton are going to take it in their bodies after eating or consuming phytoplankton. It's going to reach higher levels than in our small organisms like flying fish. And then finally, by the time we get up to, you know, a shark or some high level consumer, it's going to reach a really, really high level. And that's because that shark had to eat so much biomass from the level below, which had to eat so much biomass from the level below. And so we can see how the bioaccumulation within an individual organism leads to biomagnification in these top predators that had to eat so many of those organisms that had bioaccumulated it. So again, a third time we've kind of touched on the difference between bioaccumulation and biomagnification. So I'm hoping this helps because it is such a tricky concept. So we should know that because it accumulates in the bodies of these top predators, and can be a neurotoxicant there, so it can damage their nervous systems, humans can also get exposure to methylmercury from seafood. So when we eat large predatory fish, you know, especially things like tuna and salmon, that's going to lead to us taking that methylmercury into our body. So we can see in this diagram here how when a human is added to this you know, food chain as a quaternary consumer here, the human may be exposed to a level of this pollutant that's far higher than the primary consumer in this ecosystem. And so biomagnification uh, can be limited to just natural food systems, but it can involve humans when we become quaternary consumers or high level consumers in these aquatic ecosystems that may be contaminated with methylmercury. So for FRQ 8.8 today, I want you to try to identify a testable hypothesis for this experiment. So scientists are suspecting that the compound smedium which is released from worn down bike tires is biomagnifying in the tissues of aquatic organisms. Um, they're going to look at a specific lake nearby, uh, wherever this uh, smedium is being released from worn down bike tires. And I want you to identify a testable hypothesis that scientists may use for this study.